Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome, and thanks to everybody for attending today's webinar on getting faculty buy-in for digital learning innovation. I'm Allison Mortland, Marketing Manager here at Realize It, and your host for today's discussion, which will be led by Realize It CEO, Manoj Kulkarni. We're excited to get to today's discussion, but first, just a few housekeeping notes. Today's presentation will be about 30 minutes long, and then we'll have some time afterward for your questions, which we're looking forward to. This session is being recorded and will be shared with all of you after the event. You can enter your questions at any time during the discussion by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom window. We will be reserving those questions for after the initial discussion, but please feel free to put them in as we go along. And now at this time, I'm pleased to introduce Realize It CEO, Manoj Kulkarni. Thank you, Allison. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for participating uh, in today's uh, discussion. Uh, it's all about digital learning innovation and the role that faculty play in it. And I'm really pleased to introduce two leaders uh, on the panel today uh, who will be joining in the discussion. Uh, Dr. Jay Garvey Pike, Director of Center for Learning, Teaching and Learning at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Welcome, Garvey. Thank you. And Dr. Tom Cavanaugh, Vice Provost for Digital Learning at the University of Central Florida. Welcome, Tom. Now, these two leaders are absolutely, when it comes to digital learning innovation, and you think of two leaders, these are the leaders who are not only known for their thinking, thought leaders, but also people who are leading the charge on the innovation agendas and, and making it happen. So I'm really pleased uh, that they're joining us on this discussion today and we're hoping to learn a lot in terms of how they think about it and how they're going to uh, go about it or are going about it, have gone about it. Um, so with that, let's get into the topics that we want to talk today about faculty involvement um, and its role and importance and ways um, related to digital learning innovation. Now, when it comes to um, these things, context always matters. So I'm going to ask um, Garvey and Tom in that order to just take a few minutes and level set the context and the background for us in terms of how within your institutions, within your context areas, what this all means so we have a better idea about where you're coming from. So Garvey, you want to take it up first? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm at UNC Charlotte. And for those of you that don't know, it's a large public university in the UNC system. Uh, I think we're like the second largest now in terms of undergrads. And we've been growing um, between 750 and 1,000 students a year for the last 15 years. So we've really been uh, a growth campus. And as part of that, it brings on its own challenges, right, with space and uh, with student success and other things. Um, so that's a little bit about sort of UNC Charlotte, but I think where a lot of our energy is, is student success. I know that's kind of, you know, true everywhere, but in a, as being in a city campus uh, and a city that's growing as fast as Charlotte is, um, you know, our fortunes are sort of tied to growth and tied to Charlotte. And uh, there are a lot of different kinds of student needs here. And we have a lot of transfer students. I think transfer students now exceed our first full-time, you know, first-time freshmen. Uh, so we have people coming in to UNC Charlotte with different backgrounds, different experiences uh, from all over, uh, being, you know, again, a city campus. And, you know, we want to get students in and we want to, you know, teach them something and we want them to graduate uh, with meaningful educational experiences. Uh, and, you know, as we've seen sort of a nationwide uh, growth of you know, metrics and analytics and the kinds of things that um, university systems and, and higher ups want to see happen is, um, you know, how, how can we help students succeed? And a lot of that means passing their classes and graduating on time. So how do we you know, shorten time to degree? and make sure that students are really learning. So that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, what we're doing right now with adaptive learning in particular, and you know, personalized and adaptive learning is our biggest effort in, in uh, digital um, innovation right now, is that uh, we're kind of in the piloting stage and the early building stage, and we've had you know, a few um, successful you know, trials, uh, you know, under our belt here. And, and for us, our challenges are 
you know, how do we scale up and how do we go beyond not just the one section, but how do we scale that to all sections of the course? And then how do we build entire programs, uh, you know, that sort of one course can articulate to the next and really get more value out of this kind of learning for the student. And, um, and I think some of the things we'll talk about today is it's more than just finding um, a few faculty who want to do this. It's like, what does the university do to support this kind of teaching? Uh, what kind of support do students need in this kind of learning? And we're really advocating for learning. Um, and, that's, and you might think, well, we're doing that all the time, but not necessarily, right? So this, this is a really a different kind of learning that we're talking about. We're, we're having conversations about mastery learning and lifelong learning uh, in a meaningful way and not a perfunctory way or not in a cliche way. Uh, so how do we advocate for students and student learning? And how do we advocate for faculty? Uh, faculty want to teach this way, that faculty want to engage in their students this way. So organizationally, um, structurally, what are we doing to make this work? And, um, there, and, and I know I talked a lot about real learning and mastery learning, but there has to be real enjoyment. And that's a huge thing. Students should enjoy school. They should enjoy these learning experiences. And faculty should enjoy these too. They should enjoy the ways that they engage with students and they should enjoy teaching. If it's not enjoyable and satisfying, then, you know, it's, that's, I don't know if it's worth doing. Um, so we really want it to be that. Um, where do I come into this personally? Uh, you know, I really believe in this stuff. I think this is, uh, I like to say that this is a uh, instructional technologies promise that has long been coming and we're seeing it fulfilled now. Um, you know, through personalized and adaptive learning is just uh, everything is kind of coming together right now with this particular way of teaching with this particular pedagogy. And um, the other thing I've seen, and this has been true for a long time, even prior to these latest efforts, but uh, to get the most value out of uh, any project is we really have to think about how do we fully redesign a learning experience, the course, uh, everything about it, you know, full redesign of a course and not just uh, bolt on magic beans type of solutions. This is really, really big stuff. Right. <clears throat> um, thanks, Garvey. Uh, Tom? Sure. Uh, thanks, Manoj. Um, actually, here at UCF, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, similarities with what Garvey just described at UNC Charlotte. So we are a large public um, metropolitan uh, research university. We're in Orlando, and um, I heard this morning that uh, this is the third year in a row. Orlando, I think, is the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country. So uh, we, we are tied, uh, very much like Garvey described, to the fortunes of our, our surrounding area. Uh, I've been told a thousand people move into Florida every day. Um, so it's a, it's a fast growing state with a lot of need for education. And UCF has uh, grown to try and meet that need. Um, we, we are a large institution. This uh, fall, we had um, 70,000 students uh, headcount. And um, when we think about the, um, the kind of technology that we need, um, it's in the service of, of those students. And, and addressing it at scale. So um, how can we help support each one of those students and their individual needs, but in a scaled environment? It's something that we're always wrestling with because we, we don't want to think of any of these 70,000 students as just a number or a category because they each have individual needs and individual challenges um, and requirements. Uh, at a broader level, the context that we live in within the state of Florida from a policy standpoint is uh, the university system in Florida is funded through a performance funding model. So we are kind of hyper focused on on the performance metrics uh, and many of them have to do with student success that we can we can have a direct impact on at least within my division uh, in digital learning. When we look at things like blended learning and adaptive learning and online learning uh, access and success time to graduation. We've done studies on all of those and uh, educational technology has an impact on all of it. So in my role, my job is to try to um, kind of point the resources of, of the division of digital learning at some of these, uh, these bigger requirements, the, uh, the, the time to graduation, the student success, uh, student engagement, and you know, kind of to the topic of this discussion today, all of that is mediated through the faculty. 
So um, within my department, um, we view the faculty as our primary customer and the, um, the students are kind of our secondary customer. Great, thank you. I mean, Tom, uh, you you brought it in in terms of the goals are similar, um, and I think both uh, when you when I compare and contrast where UNC is and where UCF is, I think from a stage wise, maybe at different spots where UNC is probably more in the initiate to grow mode, uh, that perhaps UCF is more in the grow to scale mode with that. And I think we'd love to hear a little bit more about that as well. But then when we get to the point where, Tom, you said that everything is mediated to the faculty, all the aspirations, all the goals have to mediate through the faculty, and the university leadership and administration has to be seeing the faculty more as a customer in terms of helping them do that. On the topic that we've tried to put in in terms of the word buy-in, and it's a big word, buy-in, it could have a positive connotation, it could have a negative connotation in that. Break down for us in terms of what that means in your context, what does buy-in really mean? What are the components of buy-in that you're focused on from a faculty perspective? We all agree on the notion that they're absolutely important. Um, that they are crucial to the success of any innovation, particularly around pedagogies and learning um, innovations. Help us understand what buy-in, how you process buy-in within your institutions and what that means. You want to start, Gardner? Tom, you want to take that first? All right, I'll go ahead and start. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I mean, yeah, there's a lot in that question. You know, you know, you know buy-in means, um, in one sense, adoption, right? Our faculty using this thing, this tool, whatever it might might be, and it can be as as broad an enterprise as the LMS, or as niche and focused as just some app that they want to use. Um, but you don't get buy-in by just buying something and saying, here you go, faculty. Uh, it has to actually solve a problem for them or accomplish some goal for them. Um, so nothing that, we do nothing um, <laughs> abstracted from faculty. You know, we've got our own faculty advisory board. We work directly with faculty and we, we would never even evaluate. We might evaluate something initially and then bring faculty in and say, what do you think? Does this meet this goal for you? Ac you know, accomplish this objective? And I have found that even if faculty like something, if it's difficult to adopt, if it's difficult to uh, roll out, it's really hard to kind of get that scale um, because they're busy, right? Uh, our faculty are super busy um, between course prep and you know, grant applications and scholarship research, teaching classes, serving on committees, you name it, their days are full. And then if I come to them and I say, I've got this great opportunity for you, um, they might say, that's great, but I don't have time. Tom. So I think part of the buy-in process is getting senior administration to recognize that you have to invest in this. If, if you want to have the return, there has to be an investment. Um, and, and sometimes that's as simple as just a, a course release, just giving faculty time and space to innovate, to do that course redesign, sort of what Garvey was alluding to. If you don't give faculty the time and space to do the kind of innovation that you want that will have an impact, then, um, then in many cases, it probably just won't happen. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, everything you said. I mean, it's, uh, I, I even say, yeah, buy-in is almost a misnomer sometimes, or, you know, as Manoj pointed out, you know, we, it can be pro or con, depending on the connotation, but um, we're really not talking anyone into anything. Um, we're matching needs or desires with solutions. So if there's a faculty need to do something, then we're helping them solve that problem. And that's really where it has to stem from. Um, Cause you know, it's like, like Tom said, we're in the same business where the faculty are our primary clients and then everything, you know, to the student flows from that. Obviously we want to keep the students and the students needs, you know, as when we're talking about teaching and learning, we want to keep those sort of at the top of the priority list. Um, but it's really uh, how do we how do we partner with faculty and how do we find faculty and how do we identify faculty who want to do innovative, interesting things and they're out there. Um, you know, at any at any school, whether you're a large school or a small school, uh, we have you know 1,400 faculty and 
another 500 adjuncts, and I'm sure Tom has even more than that on both those counts. Um, you know, you almost don't want too many. <laughs> you could almost be crushed if everyone wanted to invade all at once, right? So there are people out there that want to do things, and sometimes it's an awareness thing that they didn't realize there was a solution or there was a way that they could do something differently um, that they've been trying to do. A great example is um, when we started building active learning classrooms more on campus, there was a lot of pent up demand for that. There were a lot of faculty who had already changed their course to um, active learning, you know, primarily active learning mode uh, in pedagogy. And they were doing it in, you know, tiered classrooms with bolted down seats and it was uncomfortable for the students and you'd have to spend more time sort of getting up and moving around, but they were doing it. Uh, so we were able to, you know, match a solution with a, a faculty need that was already there. And then once people became aware of it and said, wait a minute, you can teach this way. And they're like, yeah, it's more fun. I like it more as a teacher. My students are doing better. And, you know, so that, that's how sometimes adoption can spread that way too. Is, is, and that goes back a little bit to what I said earlier was faculty satisfaction is important. We should enjoy what we do. Can I add one thing to that? Um, Go ahead. You know, I think I think Garvey's right. You you can typically find some faculty. Every campus has them, who are willing to try some stuff, who are willing to experiment, to take some risks, to actually put in some effort. But what I have found is that, you know, obviously that's a minority of faculty, and we love working with them. But if you want to reach scale and some sort of institutional impact, you have to kind of get past those early adopters that are a couple of standard deviations off the off the mean there. Um, so in order to move the needle with this this broader kind of um, you know buy-in to use your term um, it it needs to actually make faculty's lives some in some way easier um, they all i think want to see better student success i don't know if i've talked to a faculty member here that that doesn't want students to to succeed and graduate but if i came to them with a solution that that helped students succeed yet made their lives twice as hard, um, it's probably not gonna get adopted because you need to satisfy both dimensions there. So in order to kind of turn the corner from the early adopters to a broad you know, uh, adoption at scale, then, um, then it, needs to, it needs to satisfy both faculty and student needs. And that's something so, our, our provost said. Ahead, long, ahead, yeah, thanks. Something our provost said a long time ago that stuck with me ever since I heard it was that, um, you know, anything, we're really looking for things that can do two things, can save faculty time and engage students. Like, and sometimes we look down our noses at things if we call them mere productivity tools. I would never act like that's a bad thing. Uh, time is, is probably the most precious thing we have. And especially for faculty who are overtaxed and overburdened. And when you talk about your innovators, whether they're you know, your early adopters or even, you know, later on as we're, we're scaling out and getting more people, they st their time is still super precious and, and they're the same kinds of people who are called on to a lot of different other projects as well. So, you know, anything that can save faculty time and engage students is a good thing. Yeah, so I think that's, that's awesome, right? Because I think one of the things that we're talking about is that we need to empathize with the faculty and really understand what they go through, particularly when the demands that are being placed to make these kind of changes that, you know, candidly, they carry a lot of risk for them. They don't have the time associated with it. And perhaps buying has to change to faculty involvement and investment. Those are the two aspects that I'm hearing right now uh, in it. Uh, can you help us understand or talk to uh, about what exactly are you doing about faculty involvement? How do you go about trying to select them um, is there a selection? What is the faculty profile that you typically see? So just uh, frame the involvement piece for it. And I think it'll be really uh, interesting to understand what investment, what does investment mean? Tom, you said investment, right? So from a s incentive, support, um, expertise gap, addressing time, addressing the risk associated with it, um, how, how, how are you doing it? What is happening to make that work in your institutions? I guess I can start again. Um, you know, there I could probably give you a, a you know a dozen different examples, but um, uh, maybe maybe one uh, that will be illustrative. So uh, I'm thinking about when we switched to our current learning management system, which we did back in 2012, and we were testing 
three different LMSs at the same time that we were running an existing LMS. And we needed faculty to actually teach real live classes in these things so that we knew, you know, if it would work in our context and what they preferred. So we brought everybody together and I remember holding this meeting with them and saying, look, you know, we, we need you to have a certain um, <laughs> comfort with, with ambiguity and risk. And if anybody here is on a, on a, is not tenured and is on a 10 year clock and um, is worried that you could potentially end up with, with poor student evaluations just because of the technology that, that we haven't mastered yet, uh, speak now because um, you know, no harm, no foul, you can step out. Um, and if you stay in and something goes wrong, uh, I am prepared to write a letter uh, that would go in your promotion and tenure file that sort of explains and, and holds you harmless um, and I have any conversation with your dean or chair uh, so that it doesn't you know, negatively impact you. When you talk about risk, um, at least in a, in a context where there's tenure and promotion, that's probably the biggest risk um, for faculty. And then when you talk about um, um, barriers to innovation and getting faculties sort of to, to come on board, um, it's, I think, time. I think Garvey's right. I think time is the biggest, the biggest barrier, um, even more so than just giving faculty a stipend or something. It's, it's giving them the time, the course release, to do the, the redesign, the innovation, and then giving them the support, wraparound, instructional design, media production, and assessment kind of support. Garvey, your thoughts? Garvey, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I had muted myself. There's a conversation. Yeah, um, yeah short terms, I, I agree, everything. You know, in the short term, you have to honor the time commitment. So I, I'd say you talk to just about any faculty who's doing, you know, innovative type work, and they'd probably rather have the course release than the, you know, modest stipends that we're usually able to give for this kind of thing. Um, long term, you know, we also have to think long term, and like, what are the structural barriers that are keeping things from happening, uh, whether innovation or scale or whatever that might be. Um, because teaching and teaching innovation aren't always formally valued, uh, you know, consistently across the board in the same way. So while it may appear in an RPT document, are they really, you know, promoting that and reappointing and giving tenure based on these things to those in those tracks. And then, um, you know, so we have to have like longer term parts of this as well. Are there policy implications? Are there ongoing conversations we need to have as we elevate sort of these things to leadership um, with campus leadership, through campus leadership? And, and we have to sort of elevate the work and find ways to do that, whether it's submitting projects for awards and sort of, you know, for external validation for faculty, um, getting provost recognition, presenting together at conferences. All those things are hugely important to sort of move the conversation bigger at the campus level that says, you know, this is who we are as a, or, or aspiring to as a campus, that we want this level of, you know, faculty involvement, uh, you know, with these kinds of projects to, to be leading these and seen as leaders, because uh, they are, I mean, they're the leaders in the classroom every day. And we want to honor and value that. And we also want to show that this is the kind of campus we are, is that we're, we're putting faculty and students first. Awesome. So I'm hearing a few things. I mean, there's obviously the risk and reward aspect of it that needs to be taken into consideration. There's sort of the challenges and barriers and whether there's effort challenges or expertise challenges, time challenges, um, support challenges that are needed to be able to really acknowledge that and build a capability to within the institution to be able to do that. So to that point, Tom, how is your how is your organization um, set up and how is it helping, you know, how is it set up to help faculty today? And I would ask the same question of Garvey to follow up with that afterwards. Well, I mean, as I said, faculty are our primary customer, if you think about it in those terms. And um, at least within our Center for Distributed Learning, um, all of the services that we provide are centered around the faculty. So I would say at the center of the bullseye would be our instructional design team uh, who uh, are assigned on a one-to-one on -one basis with faculty to kind of work side by side as a consultant to help them construct their course. And that instructional designer mediates all the other services that are available to faculty. And all of this is at no cost to their departments. This is all funded through, through a distance learning fee that students pay. And um, 
the, the instructional designer will help the faculty member uh, come up with instructional design strategies for their course, as well as media strategies and, and put them in touch with our video team or our graphics team or programming team um, and, and really kind of bring expertise to bear of resources, uh, strategies and assets that the faculty member might otherwise not even have thought of. We've had cases where a faculty member comes and says, I, I want a video for my course. I say, well, why don't you talk to your instructional designer before you go to the video producer? And but when they talk to the instructional designer, they realize, well, maybe that interactive crossword puzzle is a much better solution than some video. They just didn't even know that was an option. So our our role is to is to add value to the process and to um, make the the faculty's vision of the course to actually exceed their own vision uh, of the course. And then um, on the back end, uh, we do assess everything. Um, through through the work of Chuck Jubin and Patsy Moskal, we we evaluate, assess, we support, uh, and co-author and co-research with faculty um, for those departments where uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning is valued because it's valued in more in some departments more than others, but in those departments where it is, um, we will help them uh, to actually research and publish in that domain, um, and and that's been a that's been a huge benefit in. an uh, drawing faculty into this process as well. Garvey? Well, I pretty much echo everything Tom said, except we don't have Chuck and Patsy, unfortunately, but we do, we do assess things. Um, yeah, I, I know we're kind of getting close to our time here, but I mean, um, one of the things, you know, a couple of things I wanted to add, sort of add or flesh out or, you know, sort of round out a little bit is just, is that we do have the same kind of thing. We have the, you know, faculty are part of an ecosystem, a support ecosystem, whatever that might be with our instructional designers, media production, all, you know, all those things. So we're, we're sort of helping guide and uh, move projects through doing project management and everything else, because we have to be able to take off the faculty plate things that they wouldn't know how to do or that they don't have time for. It's really not their value. I mean, that's probably the biggest driver, right? Is that the faculty member shouldn't have to engage with advising to make sure the right students know about the course or, you know, with the registrar to make sure that they have the right classroom. You know, these needs, that, that isn't for the faculty member to have to try to fight and negotiate through all, you know, all the different sort of operational things that we can help make happen. So that I think, and I, I'm sure Tom does the same kind of stuff in his centers. You, you're, we're engaging with so many different campus partners to make these projects happen is that, you know, we want to honor the faculty time and, and have their expertise be uh, and their time to use for the things that only they could do, which is, you know, about their course and learning outcomes. And, and so, you know, and what else can we do for them? We're going to do all those other things. Um, but really, just as long as everyone on the team has that student first mindset, um, it's going to, that's the biggest, you know, sort of driver for this is that when faculty have already made that leap that, you know, student learning and the students are first, um, I know we used to talk a lot about student-centered learning, but it's really more than that. I mean, it's a whole mindset around this. And uh, if you have the wrong mindset, it's really going to be difficult to make a project like this work, even from early adoption through scale. Um, you know, this, a friend of mine here says that we have to act like um, we're not a filter, but we're a pump, right? So we're not filtering out students who can't succeed. If we've admitted them, we've said, you can succeed here. So once they're admitted, what can we do to pump them through the system as needed and help them? Um, and, and that's really a key thing is that it's really about the students. Um, and until we have that mindset, um, these things are very hard to accomplish. And also I'd, I'd say, you know, we want people to have a personal stake in this, whatever that might be. Could be student success, it could be research agenda, uh, could be trend setting, could be getting more recognition in their college, whatever it might be. Um, but when people see a personal stake in this, that makes it more meaningful as well. So, um, so, so what I'm hearing is definitely a structure that needs to be put in place, a sort of support structure that need to be put in place to be able to help without which this is not going to get initiated or it's going to just get experimented. But it definitely for growing it and scaling, you need to put the right support structures in place. Um, uh, we'll come back to this if, if, you know, if we have time after the questions. But what I'd like to do right now is you know, open it up for questions and see what we're getting. We have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is from an instructional design perspective, um, and I'd like to expand it more than instructional design's perspective, just in terms of organizational structure perspective. 
uh, what strategies and resources are you using or suggesting to use to help faculty, you know, build their uh, innovations in there? How are you, how are you helping from an instructional design perspective? I've been starting first. I'll let Garvey go first. Okay. I mean, it, it comes back to something, you know, we talked about earlier is we really are have to match needs with um, what, you know, what faculty want to do and what their students need to what we can possibly provide for them as a solution. Uh, sometimes there's niche tools that serve a particular need. Sometimes there's enterprise tools. Um, but I think, you know, the instructional designer has to kind of do a lot of different things. Um, and I mean, that's the, the beauty and the curse of being an instructional designer is that you see, you know, that systems perspective and you see all the things that play into success of a project and things that need to be taken care of. Um, so I, I'm not sure, like, how do we support things? Again, I mean, it, it's kind of within an ecosystem. Sometimes it, it, I understand that different universities have different cultures and contexts and different resource levels. Um, and sometimes uh, to be successful, all you need is one other person to talk with, to work with, to believe in the project, uh, to bounce ideas off of. So if you have, if you're a campus that has just, you know, your tiny campus, you have one instructional designer trying to do it all, that sometimes it's gonna, it's not only gonna have to be enough, but sometimes it really is enough. You get, you know, the, the lone faculty innovator uh, who has a, a partner, a friend, and you know, that colleague that they work with. Get the two of them in, let's have a conversation. Let's, let's talk with your department, whoever it is. So I think we can do things small or we can do things big. And, and they'll succeed either way. So you're the, definitely the hub of innovation where, you know, the information, the resources, the awareness, the interest, the trials, they all have to be supported, you know, through that hub. Tom? Yeah, I mean, at the, I don't want to repeat what I said before about, you know, trying to create time and space for faculty. So given all of that, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll give a maybe a very specific sort of answer to a, a strategy that we have used and that's, that's faculty development. Um, in a scale environment like the one that we operate in where we have literally thousands of sections of online courses every, every semester, um, it, it would be really hard to do a summative evaluation of all of those courses. You know, we spot check and we work with faculty on a continual basis but we really try to build our quality in upfront in the faculty development side of things in the kind of formative uh, uh, side of things. So um, trying to help faculty build a really good foundation and we build innovative practices into that faculty development. For example, um, helping faculty understand that when they do something, when they build an online course in an LMS, that a large percentage of students are going to be consuming that in a mobile environment and what that form factor looks like affects how you you write your text i remember uh, i used to i might even still have it in some old courses refer to you know click the submit button on the left to submit your assignment or something well in a mobile environment there is no menu on the left so that kind of uh, awareness of faculty to to be a little more um maybe generic and um, be able to write some uh, text in their courses that, um, that can be consumed in multiple ways by students. And that, I mean, that's just one example. I could probably give you a bunch more. Um, I think building all of that in up front to the faculty development really helps faculty to have a good foundation to then build on top of that. So it's, it's, you're not like talking about the foundations and the basics when you really want to innovate. You've got that foundation already there. Now we can talk about, okay, now that you know students are gonna be consuming in a mobile environment and your whole content is set up to support that, what cool assignments could you do? Send them out into the field and take pictures of things on their phone and have that post automatically. Like you can kind of take it to the next level once you've established um, that foundation. So definitely you want your, your team to be developed to the point that they're just not producing stuff, but they're actually designing the stuff with the faculty at the same time as well. So a follow on question, which is a great question to the stuff that you're talking about online is, if you're putting a program online and you need a particular faculty member to teach a course, but they're not one of your early adopters, how do you go about enticing them to participate wholeheartedly? It, in our context here, I'll go first because I think my answer is going to be short. Um, uh, our unit is an is a academic support unit, which means I don't hire faculty to teach. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not responsible 
as weird as it sounds, for the quality of the online courses. We, we work with faculty, we support and encourage and um, have processes in place to ensure things are quality, but at the end of the day, it's the academic department that are responsible for hiring faculty, for the academic quality of all of their courses, regardless of modality. So um, in our case, it would be working with the department chair to make sure that, um, that they've got sufficient faculty to teach the courses that need to go online by accreditation standards um, and that they can be taught in a scope and sequence that's comparable to a to a face-to-face -face, um, delivery model. So um, I think that's that's a um, an academic departmental culture question, at least at UCF, as opposed to um, something that I have direct control of. Yes, same same for me. Same on every count. Um, I would say, you know, sort of the what needs to be accounted for when we are talking about that on that academic department side is that there has to be a commitment to scale. Uh, there has to be, a, you know, leadership commitment that's active and vocal and participatory and actively leading faculty to these things. So it goes back to something I said earlier about, you know, sort of what are the structural barriers to keeping this from happening uh, that can happen at the academic department level uh, more typically than in a support center. Uh, is that we really have to try to help um, faculty leaders, you know, chairs and assistant deans and associate deans um, meet their goals. You know, what, what is important to them? What's important for their college? And that we can help them align uh, their projects uh, and their project outputs and their project goals with, you know, what's important to them. And, you know, the old question, you know, what would help, you know, you get a gold star on your report you know, kind of thing. It's, not about it's not about me or us so look um, it's 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 great that you folks have built your did, did we lose Tom yeah um, okay it's uh, it's it's great that you've you've kind of built these capabilities and and gotten the support from from leadership to do that but as you look at within your own institutions which have which are large how how we what does your outreach to faculty look like how are you promoting your capabilities and services to your faculty community and a follow-on question to that is what are they really expecting from you hmm. well, that's a good point I mean a good question uh, one of the things that we do and you know when we talked uh, earlier uh, is you know, how do we select faculty for these things and how do we, you know, know who's good, you know, the right fit for certain projects or that, you know, and, and for us, it's um, relationships are very important to us and our center. It's really the lifeblood of what we do. Um, and that's part of our driving philosophy of what we do. So, I mean, there's certain things that we do. There's marketing and internal marketing and we do showcases and other things to, to show off all the great things faculty are doing. And that's the key, right? It's not just here's what we're doing, but here's what your colleagues are doing. And that's part of it. But by having these relationships, you know, formally and informally and having these personal connections, we have sort of ears and eyes out to the, the campus to know what different needs are. And, you know, as we're trying to match needs with, you know, solutions or tools, having those relationships is key. So when we hear of something coming up, uh, maybe it's a new video chat tool or something we, you know, it's like, we know, we already know, like, who would want this, you know, and, are like, are, can we reach out to them? Are they aware of this for the kinds of things they want to do? Um, so, you know, in, in any sort of digital innovation, it's important that we have those kinds of relationships with people. Cause that's really, when we, we talked about buy-in, we're not, we're not getting people to buy in. We're, we're aligning their needs with potential solutions. Yeah, I think we've lost, uh, thank you, Garvey. I think we lost Tom momentarily, but I know he's, um, He's dialing back. I'm, I'm actually back. back. Audio. I'm okay. on audio. No, yeah. Okay. All right. So the question, maybe you want to answer the question as well, which is around um, uh, how are you, what does the outreach look like to the faculty community in your institution, meaning that they are aware of the services and you're actively engaging them, um, you know, with respect to that. So just help us understand how you're doing outreach to your faculty. Well, multi-channel, um, and, it, and it really depends, um, I think, in many cases on what we're trying to do. But um, 
you know, we do, uh, we have our own list serves that we, we send messages out. We post, <laughs> we post messages within the LMS, which fortunately we kind of control that. Um, but what seems to be frankly most effective is, is personal messaging from the faculty members assigned instructional designer. Like, hey, Manoj, um, I think you would be great at um, this thing that we're, you know, this, this tool that we want to pilot, um, you know, for these reasons. Or, you know, get this course that you're teaching, I think would be a great submission to our online teaching award or, or whatever. Uh, that sort of personal connection, which can be a little bit more time consuming to, to do, it is the most effective. Yeah, so uh, there was one question in here, and I can promise you that was, this was not from Realize It. So uh, it's really around, but I think it's a good question. I think it's a great question in the sense that, you know, this is an ecosystem. Um, and certainly what you folks are, are describing is that, you know, you need to develop the ecosystem, understand the people who are the stakeholders in there, figure out how the connections need to be made in there to make that happen. What, how do you folks see you know, a digital learning vendor, somebody who is from the outside partnering with you, what is their role in, in helping you establish either those resources or the culture um, that encourages this value that you're talking about? So, you know, the specific question was, how do you see a vendor's role in the establishment of that culture at the university that encourages the student focus and values the work of teaching online? Yeah, this is Garvey. For me, it's really um, having shared goals and that there's an understanding of our culture and our needs. Uh, and I think that goes a long way. We're not just, you know, I think I feel like the la a lot of the last 40 minutes we've been talking kind of philosophically more than operationally or mechanically. And I think that's important. I think that's where these projects succeed or fail is, you know, every bit as important as the leadership and philosophical perspective. So having that shared uh, project outcomes and shared goals. That's what we're looking for in a vendor. It's not someone who can provide sort of wrench turning and throwing a solution over the wall and saying, here, it's done. But, you know, I, I want the vendor partner to feel like, you know, our success is their success and vice versa. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, and in fact, uh, I like that word that Garvey used, uh, partner. That's the word we use here. Sometimes we say commercial partner. Because, you know, we're not looking for some sort of, in most cases, transactional relationship with our commercial partners because uh, we, have a, we have a shared goal. We want, we want to accomplish something together. And in most cases, it has to do with student success. So we, <laughs> as a big client with high expectations, uh, we sometimes can be challenging. Um, we know that. But we also view this as a win-win, um, uh, as a partnership, a true partnership where uh, in many cases, and we've done this with Realize It, we've, we've done co-research and co-presented, and I think moved the needle as far as uh, understanding the, the kind of state of the art of, um, in this case, adaptive learning, that, that maybe we wouldn't have uh, been able to do without each other. Uh, so I, I, honestly, it, it's a real partnership from our perspective. Yeah, so I think the, the, the thing in there is really, it's something that everyone says, which is value add, but it's like, what is the value add that you need to put, you know, in there, but really creating the proper win-win uh, scenarios, and then knowing that there is a proper partnership that needs to be built seems to be, you know, the, the success, because, you know, the vendors, um, and we don't, you know, yes, we're, we're obviously a commercial partner, as you said, um, but speaking from a vendor's perspective, you know, what we want to definitely see is the commitment and the expectations laid out. Um, and we'd like to contribute to the thought leadership. I think the question is how much, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to make a change and bring about change. And the question becomes, how does a vendor really play a role in terms of shaping that thought leadership as well uh, within the institution? So with that, I think, uh, do we, I think we are exactly at time. I know there are a couple of other questions that were on the table. Uh, unfortunately, we are not going to have the time to uh, address those on the call over here, but certainly what we'll do is circulate them to Tom and Garvey and, and try to get the answers uh, for you um, to make that happen. I'd like to take this opportunity to really thank Garvey and Tom 
for taking the time to be on this call and providing the great insights. And uh, as you can see, we've just we couldn't even scratch the surface in 30, 35 minutes. There's a lot that needs to be done in it. But if there's interest in, in, in digging deeper, particularly on the operational and tactical aspects of it, then certainly we would be open, if Tom and Garvey are open, to kind of having more follow-up sessions in terms of dealing into those details. But by all means, if, if you have uh, more questions, then you can reach out to us, uh, or you can reach out to Tom and, and Garvey and, I'm, you know, and, and seek their, uh, their guidance on it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Allison for any final thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Manoj. Thanks again to Garvey and Tom. Appreciate everybody's time who joined us today. As a reminder, you all will receive the recording of this event in your email in the next few days, and we'll be alerting you of any upcoming webinars as well. So thank you all very much, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.